The word innovation conjures images of an Apple CEO brandishing a sleek new product in an online video. But innovation can be deployed behind the scenes for an equally profound impact. That's the idea behind a new book by INSEAD professors of technology and operations management Sergei Netesin and Karen Garotra, who argue business model innovation, or BMI, can help companies adapt to rapidly changing customer demands. They join me now on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Our pleasure to be here. The title of your book is The Risk-Driven Business Model. What types of risk are you talking about? When we say risk, we are thinking more um, risk comes in many forms and flavors. Financial risk that perhaps perhaps uh, most of us are, uh, are very familiar with. We are talking more of hidden risks. Risks which are hidden in the operational model, in the business model of the company. So for instance, a risk could be Apple comes up with an iPhone 5C, will they have enough of those in stock in the right colors, in the right uh, uh, memory sizes, um, of, uh, as much as different people might want them. So that kind of risks are, are, I think, more distinct and different and often hidden as compared to financial risks. So we're talking of those, um, those kind of operational or more business model risks. Yeah, another risk which uh, might be uh, might be the kind of risk that we are talking about, which comes more from incentives. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, if we take take back to the same iPhone example, you know, if uh, if if we are talking about Apple as a company, it might have very different incentives to stock and sell this iPhones than a store manager might have, or you know, manager of a retail channel or of online channel, and. That's also a risk. That's a risk of misaligned incentives, which at the end may hurt a company, uh, Apple as a company, and it may hurt uh, a store manager. And of course, in practice, there are many more other risks, like financial risks, all kinds of disruption risks, maybe other risks. But uh, in our experience, what we found is that by focusing just on those two risks, uh, the company can fundamentally revolutionize the business model, uh, its own business model, and sometimes even the business model on, of the entire industry. Like, uh, you know, like Dell, for example, has done uh, a relatively long time ago when it said, look, instead of trying to forecast what computers will be popular, what kind of technologies will be hit, uh, in the next couple of months, um, we are not going to do that. We are going to produce computers only after demand for them has occurred. And once the customer pays for the computer, we'll assemble it, we'll ship it to the customer. So this way, Dell was able to completely eliminate this information risk and build a, a new business model which the entire industry has followed. All the other companies uh, over the course of 20, 30 years introduced the same way to sell computers. Right. In your book, you say organizations can best minimize risk by exploiting decision levers. What do you mean by that? You would, could change who was making the decision. You could change uh, what decisions in itself the, the business model had to address. Um, when were those decisions being made? And perhaps most importantly, why were those decisions being made the way they were being made? So those, uh, it was almost always about changing how decisions are made. And it was almost always, almost always about changing uh, who was making the decision, what decision was being made, when it was being made, and why it was being made. And that always led to better management of risk. So that's, that's, that those are the four levels. Yeah. Just, just to go back to Dell example maybe, uh, so Dell had a fundamental uh, insight which actually was described in, in autobiography in a book um, which talked about how he looked at the entire industry and said that the fundamental problem with the industry was that the decision when to produce a computer was made long before demand from consumer materialized. Right. And so this was a simple change of a decision by saying, look, I'm going to change when the decision is made. Instead of making this decision long before I know what consumers want, I'm going to make it after I know what consumers right. want. And that's uh, one of the kind of a four ways to innovate um, around right. decision making in our book. Any more examples of companies that have successfully used BMI? Uh, you know, this recent example might be, you know, Zipcar, for example. Zipcar is a good example where um, a car rental is a car rental, so the company didn't really change uh, fundamentally the product, except uh, it started renting cars instead of daily or weekly intervals, uh, in hourly intervals. 
Um, and that fundamentally changed the game. So now you have to think about, okay, if I rent for an hour, I cannot be uh, keeping cars at the airport. It, gets, it, it takes a long time to get there. So most of the locations are in downtown. Uh, you have to make the process of renting a car very easy. You cannot have a rental counter. It all has to be electronic, etc., etc. And uh, the company, of, co of course, grew tremendously until uh, Avis, which is a kind of a legacy, kind of a normal player, uh, acquired them. Who drives business model innovation within an organization, or who should be driving it for maximum effectiveness? That's an excellent question. Something, and, and of course, uh, we described that at length in our, in our, in our book, but uh, I think the short, the way to think about it is, this innovation comes in perhaps, uh, the process of business model innovation comes in three phases. The first phase is generation of uh, what kind of innovations we might be able to do. Next phase is really selecting between these, these uh, innovations. And the final phase is really refining and testing them out, seeing if they really work or not. So what we've found, as far as the generation phase goes, it's probably, uh, this is the kind of innovations which can be generated by, uh, by, uh, by the broad-based kind of organization. It doesn't have to be only the R&D group or only one guy sitting in strategic planning who can think about them. So generation of these ideas often can, can be fairly broad-based, which, which, um, which is excellent because you can get a lot more, uh, you can lose a lot more of the company's resource into, into coming up with these ideas. However, you need to be almost contrasting when it comes to uh, the later stages of selection and more refinement or experimentation or piloting of these phases. So in piloting or experimentation, we find that a top-down approach works better that to really, really you come up with an idea, you get a lot of people to perhaps generate these ideas, but in actually executing any one or a subset of them, it often works to for a highly empowered manager, often the top management, to really, uh, 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 to really create a separate mini uh, organization. Sometimes I like calling it a little bit more the guerrilla warfare uh, strategy. You don't really get, uh, you don't really declare war on the existing business model, you really have an insurgency of, of a few people sitting outside the traditional structures who start developing the model. And for sure, this insurgency has to cover a very broad base, broad spectrum of, of people, because uh, business model incorporates in itself all parts of organization. You have to look at operational part, more marketing part, sales, finance, etc., etc. Because sometimes business model innovation is about changing, uh, you know, financial contract that the company has. Sometimes it's about, about changing operational part. But most of the time, it involves all of them. So right. it cannot be just an engineering kind of a R and D department which only employs. Uh, you know, specialists with a PhD in, you know, computer science, if you are talking about some kind of a, say, internet company. It has to be actually a pretty diverse team, right. which understands very well how the company works and how entire industry right. maybe works. Right. To get started with BMI, you advocate a thorough business model audit. That sounds pretty painful. What actually goes into such an audit? It's not painful. I think it is more, I would say it's often a revelation. It is, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a place where you, now it depends, those re revelations might be, might be painful in some cases, but it doesn't have to be. It's, uh, I think of it more, at, uh, more as looking at your organization in a, in a fashion in a, with a slightly different lenses. So our audit often is looking for, um, uh, if you remember the kind of risks we started with, is information alignment risks. The audit is really going out and looking for those symptoms of those risks. Well, I like to compare the, this to, uh, you know, financial uh, financial audit indeed, or examination of financial statements, which every organization does every year, many times uh, often. Right. You know, any public company would do it once a quarter. Um, but then when you ask the same company, how often did you examine your own business models, they'll tell you, well, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and you know, maybe partially the reason why Dell has had recent kind of financial troubles is because they've been living on the same innovation which happened around 1984. Uh, they haven't really innovated after that anymore. Right. And, and so maybe if organizations take the same kind of a discipline as they have with examining financial statements, if they take it to examination of inefficiencies in their business models and their overall kind of a business model uh, to begin with, 
I believe that uh, we can have much more innovation going on in, the, in big organizations. And surprisingly few organizations do this um, business model audit, almost nobody does. Um, one example of uh, successful company that does this audit often would be uh, Amazon. The business model fundamentally changed four at least times. four or five times here. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, I think, how Amazon has, has kept uh, far more discipline than almost any other organization we can think of. Yeah, and, and they're generally much better at experimenting with those sorts of things because they've experimented with many other things which did not necessarily work too well, which is fine. You know, if you want to innovate, many of those innovations will fail. Okay. Many more will fail than succeed. Sergey, Karen, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us.